All right, so the, the recorder is on. Um, just want to confirm that with the class, it is on. The audio is good, the video is good too. So we are ready for today's class. So today's class is a transition. This is also an important transition because we are now moving to actual programming. Okay, so this is the actual part that starts assembly language uh, programming. So let me point to you, I mean, you probably should know where we are in terms of the notes, um, but I am going to point that out too. Okay, so we are really way done with these other topics. And now we are moving on to actual assembly language programming. And today's lab is going to be the next one, which is compiling C control structures. And this is the uh, module that you hopefully have read before today's class, because you know this is the sequence. You know I just kind of followed you the next one, the next one, and the next one, and this is the one module that we are going to touch on today. So let's go ahead and take a look. Reading ahead of time is important in any type of slightly more difficult and technical class. Um, which means, you know, by the time you transition to a four-year university, you probably want to have that down as a habit so that you don't need any reminding to read ahead of the lectures because it really is an important thing. <clears throat> so for at least a good portion of this class, we are going to revisit things that you should know already, which basically means, you know, um, you might need some time to get reacquainted with some of, some of the concepts that you should have learned in CISP 360. So we're going to start with a conditional statement. Um, on the top here, we see a typical control you know, C conditional statement. And here, we have an alternative version of the code that performs exactly the same thing. So there might be a few things you have not been exposed to because you know, your professor told you, don't do this, do not use this, okay? So let's go ahead and talk about those things first, okay? So we have labels. L1 colon is a label definition, just like label definition in TTP ASM. Same thing with L2. So these label definitions are really just bulk marks. They are just symbolic names to designate, okay, this place has a name so that we can go to this place directly from some other place. Are we good so far? Are there any questions about label definitions? They have the same syntax as in TTP-ASM and, and also exactly the same meaning as in TTP-ASM. So are we good so far? Okay, no questions. So the only other construct that you may not have seen in your C++ class is the concept of a go-to, G-O-T-O. G-O-T-O go-to is J-M-P-I. So it basically just says, okay, we can at this point continue execution at any place. Tell me where I should go to continue execution. So in the case of go-to L1, it simply means go find that label L1 and continue execution over there. That's it. So go to L1 by itself is a C statement, and as a result, it can be in the then or the else portion of a conditional statement, which would be otherwise known as an if statement. So are we okay so far? Yes, go ahead. So there, there's no scoping here. Um, because there, there are no curly braces. So every label definition is visible within the entire function. So that's kind of the deal in C and C++, is label definitions are, are global within the function that it is defined. Okay, so let's take a look at the, at what, what these two pieces of code would do. We'll, we'll start with the one that we are familiar with, which is the top one. So with the top one, what happens, which block will execute if and only if C is true? Block one, right? 
So if C is false, then which block is going to have is going to execute? It'll be block two. Okay, very good. So in this particular piece of code, if C is true, then not C is going to be false. If not C is false, then the then statement of the conditional statement, which is the go to statement, will not execute. It then falls through to block one. And then after block one, it has an unconditional go to to continue execution, L2, continue execution at L2, which means we are going to skip block two in that particular case. In other words, if C is true, then we only execute block one and we do not execute block two in the second version of this code, which is the same as what the first version of the code would do. So let's take another look at what if C is false. If C is false, then not C is going to be true. If the condition of a conditional statement is true, then whatever is the then statement would occur. The then statement is simply go to L1, so that's going to execute. When go to L1 execute, we continue execution at exactly L1, which would then it, it'll fall through to block two, and then when block two is done, then we fall through to the end, the end of the entire chunk of code, which would be the same behavior as in the first chunk of code, the first version of the conditional statement. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand you know, how the second piece of code, even though it looks kind of ugly, it actually does exactly the same thing as the original conditional statement. Is that okay? All right. So some of you may be asking, but why do we do this? Why are we taking a structured statement and turn it into something that is not structured? How do we know something is structured or not? The presence of the curly braces. Okay. Because you know, the, the, bra the curly braces allow you to nest things within one within another. Without the curly braces, I mean, you can still have a conditional statement, but the then portion of the conditional statement can only be a single statement. It cannot be a block statement anymore, which means I can do one thing if the condition of the conditional statement is true, <clears throat> and the only one thing that I do is simply to continue execution at L1 in this case. Is that okay? Do we have any questions about the equivalency between the original code, which you should have understood for some time already at this point, and the new chunk of code <clears throat> that we are now talking about? Questions or no questions? Yes. That is a good question. So one thing I don't, I, I want to preserve is the ordering of block one and block two. So I still want block one to be quote unquote, you know, before block two, um, so that the code, okay, this is seen from the perspective of the compiler. A compiler goes through your C code in a sequential order, which is, you know, which means if you want to move the entire block of code around, it takes extra work and extra memory and extra time. So I want to preserve the ordering of block one and block two you know, as much as possible. So the only other thing I can do is to kind of change how I perform the branch operations. Now, do I really have to negate you know, C in order to do this? No, because I could have done if C go to, and then L1 is defined here, and then have another go to after the conditional go to, to go to the other label, but that's actually more work than it needs to be. So this is the most concise way of translating a regular con uh, conditional statement so that it is still, it still has a conditional component to it, but it is no longer if else. It is just if in this case. There's, there's no else you know, in this particular piece of code. Does that answer the question? Okay, very good. <clears throat> Any other questions regarding um, this particular portion, which is a translation of a, of an if else statement to something that has a simplified conditional statement, which is just if 
go to. No questions? So I'm going to give you guys you know, one additional insight as to why we want things to look like this. If something simple go to something, okay? Because it corresponds vaguely to the conditional jump instructions that are already in TTP ASM. We got five of those. We got JCI, JZI, JSI, JOI, and JLI. All of those are conditional branch instructions. Because the first one, JCI, says if and only if the carry flag is a one, continue execution over there. What if the carry flag is a clear is zero? Um, well, in that case, just pretend that I'm not here and continue with whatever is after the JCI instruction. That's why we are trying to convert you know, structure code into something that consists of unconditional branches, which is just JMPI, or conditional branches that has, you know, if something is true, then we go somewhere. Because you know, eventually, we're going to boil this down to a, to a single flag. Is it the C flag? Is it the Z flag? Is it the O flag? Is it the L flag? Is it the sign flag? Well, that kind of depends on what we are doing, okay? But we want to translate, we want to boil everything down to conditional to just a flag. Are we good so far? Does everybody understand why we are changing the uh, format of the statements? Okay, all right. <clears throat> so we are moving on to the more simple or the simpler version of a conditional statement, which is not 100% necessary. So in this case, we have a conditional statement that has no else, okay? It just has something to do, if and only if C is true, but if C is false, there's nothing to do. So that's a fairly easy thing to translate to. So it translates to if not C, go to L1, then block one is put here, and then label L1 is defined right after the entire block one. So is everybody convinced that this piece of code, which you are more, much more familiar with, is equivalent to this piece of code, which looks a little awkward, but you know, it's, it should do the, exactly the same thing. Are, are you convinced? Okay, you're all convinced, very good. Okay, so let's move on to a pre-checking loop, which other people just call a while loop. <clears throat> I call this a pre-checking loop instead of a while loop because you know, there's also a do while construct in C and C++. I don't want to confuse between those two. So this one checks the condition before it performs the operation, and therefore I call it the pre-checking loop. So the first one you should be familiar with already. Okay, I'm hoping no one has a question about what while C block one is going to do. Are we good so far with that one? Okay. So the second version is a little awkward because you know, we don't even see the word while anymore because that's the whole point. The whole point is I just want to boil everything down to if blah, 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 go to label and label definitions and go to's. That's all I want, okay? So with the second version, it says, okay, we define the label L1 here. <clears throat> and then we say if not C is true, I should really say, if and only if Nazi is true, go to label L2. Label L2 is right here, which basically continues execution after the while loop. What if C is true? Well, if C is true, then not C is going to be false. If not C is false, then I'm not going to go to label L2 because this is the then statement of the conditional statement, which means I fall through to block one. After block one is done, there's an unconditional branch, which is a go-to, back to label L1, so that I can start, potentially, start the next iteration. So are you convinced that this does exactly the same thing as the original nice-looking while loop, except this one just looks a little uglier? But functionally, eh, it should do the same thing. Let's say you're not convinced. What are you going to do? You have a few options. You can complain to the dean and go like, Tech, talk about something I'm not really sure about and he does not tell me how to verify. it. That's option number one. Option number two, get your debugger out. Get GDB, go to online GDB, okay? 
write whatever code you want that is a while loop, okay? Write something that you know what it is supposed to do. Put some C outs into it so you can see stuff, okay? And then convert it into the second form and then run it again. You should see the behavior of the code to be exactly the same, even though it looks different. And by single stepping through that code, you would also get a much better understanding of how it works. Now, some of you can intuitively look at the two versions of the same code and go like, you know, go through the whole thing in your mind and be convinced and go like, yeah, no, yeah, that seems to make sense. But if you're not convinced, then doing some experiments using the debugger is the best way to do it. It's the best way to understand how it works because you can single step like line by line and fully understand how it works. Are we doing okay so far in this case? Now there's one component here that I'm assuming and I know it may or may not be a valid assumption. Do you understand C syntax? Now, most of you are gonna nod your head but I'm gonna present something to you and you tell me what it is going to do. <clears throat> so I like these little exercises, okay? They're very simple, and yet if you have any misunderstanding of the concepts in C or C++, it'll be obvious, okay? You will basically go like, oh, okay, I didn't know this is gonna do that. So, nope, okay, there we go. <clears throat> okay, so this is a really simple piece of code. Uh, if A is less than B, and then we have uh, C gets C plus one, and then we have D gets D plus one. Okay, this is this is the code. Okay, well, let's yeah, yeah we'll just leave it like this. <clears throat> so I will give you some initial values. So let's say A is um, five to begin with. Let's say B is three to begin with. C is two to begin with, and D is seven to begin with. Well, these are somewhat random. You know, there are no particular reason. So I, wanted, I want you to tell me what happens after this code executes. What do you think? C equals two, and D equals eight. That is correct. So if you came to a different conclusion in your head earlier, then you might have a wrong understanding of the syntax of C and C++. <clears throat> because the indentation seems to suggest D equals D plus one is a part of the then portion of the conditional statement. It is not. This is not Python. This is one reason I do not use Python when I taught CISP 300, because you know, that gives people a wrong sense of how things would be nested in C and C++, okay? So in C syntax, there's only one then statement. After the if and the parenthesize your condition, there's only one statement that you can specify and say, this is what I want you to do if and only if the condition is true. So in this case, from the compiler's perspective, C get C plus one is the only statement that is right after the condition of the conditional statement. Well, in that case, what makes the, what about the next statement, D gets D plus one? It has nothing to do with the conditional statement. D is D plus one is after the entire conditional statement. It is not conditional to anything at all. In other words, this code here, okay, if I were to write it using curly braces to make it very clear what is nested, how, how it is nested, the nesting would start here and it ends here. D get D plus one has absolutely nothing to do with the conditional statement. So I'm not sure how many of you know this from your CISP 360 class. This is a very important piece of information that you should get from CISP 360. So I'm not making any assumptions. I just want to point this out explicitly. Are we okay so far? Okay, cool. <clears throat> so let's go ahead and mess up this program even further. So if you say else E gets E plus one, what do you think is gonna happen? Error. 
exactly compile time error. The C compiler would complain and say this else has no if to correspond to, because by the time the word, the keyword else is encountered by the compiler, there are no unclosed or open conditional statements for the else to correspond to. So it's gonna complain and say, nope, this else has nothing to correspond to, syntax error. I'm, I cannot be expecting this keyword. Yep. Uh, so in this, this would work, right, you know, in Python, sort of. Because Py but Python would require a colon here as well. I mean, the syntax is not exactly, but. Well, I really don't care because this is not a Python class. <laughs> and the only prerequisite of this class is CISP 360, which is C++. So I don't really care that much about Python. Personally, I don't program in Python either, so. All right, so are there any further questions about this example to clarify the syntax of conditional statements? Yes. Uh, yes. So if I get rid of the D, get these plus, you mean this one? Yeah, so if I get rid of this, it will compile, and then this statement will correspond to the else branch of the conditional statement. But if you think of something else to add, okay, so let's just say that we, we think of something else to add to this code and go like, oh, by the way, the else branch really need to increment your F2, so F gets F plus one, okay, this is E incrementing. Then syntactically, it is correct. And if people think that your know, F gets F plus one is a part of the else branch, it is not. It simply looks like it is, but it is not. So that's why you, know, you really have to understand you know, how the C, C, the C syntax works and what is expected by the compiler after the parenthesized condition and also after the else keyword. Because if you think, you know, if you have a misunderstanding of that, you can have a program that is syntactically correct, but it looks like it would do one thing, but it ends up doing something else. So you have to be extra careful with those things. Yes? Say that one more time. <laughs> it will not make any difference. So this code, would have meant exactly the same thing if everything is on the same line. It would still have meant exactly the same thing as before. Yes? The curly braces are block statements. So they're not scope. They do have a scope implication, but they're block statements which allows you to specify multiple statements within the open and the close brace, but the entire thing from the open to the close brace is considered one single block statement. So it is basically a folder. It, it's basically a folder. In other words, if you think about a conditional statement, is just saying that, you know, okay, if this is true, then we will do whatever that file is specifying the file, in this case, can now be a folder. And curly braces are basically folders. It is a container mechanism. So interestingly, if you want this to work and go like, but I want E and F both to increment, but I don't want to use curly braces because I have some kind of allergy to semicolons, that's okay. You can fix it. That will work. You look, you look at this and go like, what is comma? Comma is actually an operator in C and C++. I'm not gonna get into it, I just want to confuse you. That's all I wanted to do. So if you're curious about this, look it up, okay? Look up comma as an operator in C++, okay? So this code, as it is described here, okay, we can even get, get 
this line over here and even put the else over here, it still has exactly the same, same meaning. E and F are both incrementing when A is not less than B. So this is not a C class, so I'm not gonna get too much into you know, the syntax of C, but you, know, you, you might need to recheck your understanding of C if you're looking at these things and go like, I'm not sure what that is. All right, so this is your know, while, and then now we have the post-checking loop, because if there's a pre-checking, that's probably a post-checking loop. So this is the typical of a post-checking loop. It's a do while loop, do block one while C, okay? Um, and this translates to a label definition, L1, before block one, and then block one, after block one, we have a conditional go to, which is basically saying if and only if C is true, go to label L1. That means if C is true, then we go back and then we perform block one again, which then we'll check C again and then determine whether we have to go back again. So are we all convinced about the, the entire section three? Section 3.1 is about conditional statement. Section 3.2 is about pre-checking loops. And then section 3.3, what we're looking at right now, is about post-checking loop. And those are the only three control structures I'm gonna use in this class. So some of you may be asking, what about for loop? Well, a for loop is a glorified you know, while loop. That's basically what it is. Uh, what about switch statements? Well, switch statements kind of is a if statement, but it's not exactly, okay? You know, because uh, you can fall through the cases <laughs> <laughs> so it's not exactly, but I'm not, I'm not gonna get into switch statements in this class. How many people have used switch statements in your CISP 360 class? Why? What, what do you use it for? Until you forget that break after each case. <clears throat> I have nothing good to say about that. <laughs> all right, so that's it, okay? From the control structure perspective, this is all, okay? So now we look at the conditional go-to and the Boolean operators. In other words, um, how can we turn, remember the objective is to boil all the conditions in the conditional go-to's into something that only look at one of the five flags. The five flags are, once again, C, Z, S, O, L, okay? Those are the five flags. So when we have something like a negation, you go like, okay, that, we, we cannot deal with a negation. Well, then get rid of the negation. How do we get rid of the negation? Make the code a little bit more complicated. So in the original version, it says, if C is false, go to label L1. So how can we do the same thing, but without using logical not? Well, you can say if C is true, go to label L2, which is a continuation label. But if C is false, then it's not gonna go to L2 and it will fall through to go to label L1, which ends up going to label L1 just like the original code is doing. So are we convinced that <clears throat> this code here is really kind of, it looks a little ugly, but it does the same thing as the code before. But the, the one thing that we are buying, okay, we are paying in terms of having more lines of code, but what we are buying is one fewer logical operator. The logical not is now gone. Is that okay? So this entire section has to do with but what if I have a complex expression? It has not, it has and, it has or, and so on and so forth. Well, this is how we get rid of the operators. We make the control structure more complicated in order to make the expression simpler. Yes? Well, it's not so much it's an advantage, it is a necessity. Because in assembly language, tell me again, what is the only conditional mechanism? In other words, what is the only mechanism that allows us to say, you know, let's go there this time. 
and then the next time let's continue execution instead. What is the only mechanism that allows that allows us to do that? The flags, it's the conditional branch instructions looking at the flags, right? JCI, JSI, JZI, JOI, and JLI. So that's why we are doing this, because you know, in the attempt to break a C program all the way down to the point that we can write it in assembly language, this is what we need to do. Okay. So the 4.2 is dealing with logical or. In other words, what if the original expression is if C, which, is, which can be by itself a really complex condition, or D, which can also be a, another really complex expression, I don't care how complex C and D are. I just want to get rid of the or at this point of time, okay? So if, if the original code is if C or D go to label L1, and I need to get rid of the logical or, uh, this one is actually one of the easiest to deal with. Then it becomes if C go to L1, because hey, if C is true, then the disjunction has to be true. So if the disjunction has to be true, might as well just go to L1 right now. We don't have to evaluate D as a condition. Does that make sense to you? Okay, this is also, um, okay, let me finish this and I'll go back and talk about what I was attempting to talk about earlier. So what if C is false, okay? If C is false, we are not gonna do, go to L1 because of, the if, because of the first line. It's gonna fall through to the second line. The second line would then ask, um, let's check D as a condition. If D is true, ah, this gives us a second chance to go to label L1. We only continue execution after these two lines of code if both C and D are false. So does that resemble what the original code should do? This is also the reason why we have short-circuited Boolean evaluation. How many people have heard about that term from CISP 360? Okay, I get, I get a few people who remember that term. I'm not sure whether the rest of the class have actually heard about that term, just cannot remember. This is the reason why we have short-circuited evaluation. This is the, the way the code is compiled. This is also the reason why when you have logical operators, the compiler guarantees that it would evaluate from left to right. It would not change the order on you. If you have multiplication, there's no telling which side of the multiplication it will compute first. If you have addition, there's no telling. If you have subtraction, there's no telling. Okay, but when it comes to logical operators, like logical and and logical or, each the compiler has to guarantee to evaluate from left to right. Because we oftentimes rely on short-circuited evaluation to shortcut and get us out of loops, you know, because we check the bound first before we check something else when the bound is, when, some, when the index is within bound, okay? <clears throat> All right, so we are now moving on to section 4.3, which deals with logical and. The original statement is, if C and D are both true, then we want to go to L label L1, and the implicit thing of, about else is, uh, we'll just kind of fall, continue execution after the statement. Yes? Oh, sure. So short-circuited means in, it's also called lazy evaluation. Because in this case, okay, you know, if we look at the original expression here, if we know that C is true, do we have to evaluate D? No, no because in the truth table with an or, one true, exactly. So if we know that C is true, then we don't have to evaluate D. And so the mechanism that we are describing here will do exactly that. If C is true, we are going to continue execution at label L1. We don't even bother to evaluate D. And that's why it's called, it's called you know, short-circuited. Some programming languages like Visual Basic, and I suspect they have the same thing in C Sharp, has a non-short-circuited Boolean operator as well. Um, I believe you know, it is with the conjunction, it's, also, it's called and also. Um, I cannot remember exactly, but they have a special version of, a, of the Boolean operator that is not short-circuited. 
C does not have any mechanism like that. I mean, you can always emulate the result, but it does not have a built-in method to do it. Yep. Yep, and has exactly the same thing. So moving on to section 4.3. So if the original thing is, uh, if C and D are both true, we go to label L1, then the converted code will first take a look at C but negate it. So that means if C is false, not C is going to be true, then we go like, uh, we are not going to go to L1. We don't have to bother with evaluating D. We can just go straight to label L2, which is the continuation label. It's only when C is true and then not C is false, then we are not going to label L2. Instead, we fall through to the second conditional statement, and then, then it will check D. If D is also true at that case, in that case, then it will go to L1. In other words, in order to go to label L1 here, C has to be true, D also has to be true, which means it implements exactly the same logic as the original statement, and also it makes use of short-circuited evaluation. Because in order for a AND statement to be false, only up to one side has to be false. So if we know that C is false, there's no need to evaluate D. We know for sure that there's no way we are going to go to label L1. Okay, so are we okay with all of these translations? Because this is all just you know, matching a template pattern and then converting the template pattern into something that is equivalent. So we're good on, we're all good on, on this one, okay? All right, so moving on to simple reductions. So <clears throat> what this section is saying is we don't always have to do the mechanical translation like this. Many times you can rely on Boolean algebra as well as just normal algebra to do something like this. In, for instance, if you have an expression that is the negation of x is greater than or equal to y, you can use algebra and convert that to x is less than y. So you, you're getting rid of the negation, the logical knot, but without you sacrificing code because you're doing algebraic, you know, algebraic you know, operation to kind of get rid of the negation. <clears throat> the second line is, um, if you have x is less than y or if or x is greater than y, then we might as well just say, you know, x does not equal to y. So you can actually do some shortcut like this, you know, when it comes to, you know, uh, dealing with algebra stuff. Are we still doing okay so far with today's lecture? Okay. All right. What about comparisons, okay? Because you know, when you are in C and C++, you have how many comparison operators? By the way, comparison, they are called relational operators, okay? So the relational operators that we can use on integers would be less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, equal to, and then not equal to. There are six of them. So when we translate code into assembly, we want to boil everything down to one, which is just less than, okay? So it's perfectly doable, okay? Because if the original relation uh, expression is x is less than y, eh, it's already using less than, not a problem. If it was originally x is greater than y, we just have to switch the size, so it becomes y is less than x, okay? Now we are also just using less than. If the original one is x is less than or equal to y, then it becomes x is less than, less than y or x equals to y. It, x equals to y is okay because what, of what? <clears throat> what makes it easy for us to tell whether two values are the same or not? Yes. Uh, exactly, the z flag being a one tells you that the two things it's comparing are exactly the same. So it's a very easy, simple, you know, free operation. Okay, very good. Um, X is greater than or equal to Y, switch the order and then use equal to, okay? So that's not too difficult. X equals to Y is just that. X does not equal to Y is going to be logical not of X equals to Y. So you can look at this symbol as exclamation point. <clears throat> so we just need less than and equal to. 
of the five flags that we have, C and L are both looking at less than, confirming a less than. The Z flag confirms an equal to. That is the reason why we want to boil everything down to just less than or equal to. Yep. The C flag, which is basically the B flag after a subtraction operation, as well as the L flag, if they are one, if, if, if they are one, they confirm the minuend is less than the subtrahend. So when did we talk about that? Binary subtraction and binary comparison. The Z flag can be used to confirm that two things are the same, then the minor end and the, the, the minor end and the subtrahend hand are the same. So for equal to, we have that special flag that can help us you know, figure it out. So does that answer your question? Okay, excellent. Okay, great. <clears throat> so now we go to general compare, okay? So if you have some kind of compare, okay? So R is, can be less than or equal to, okay? So we have, so instead of specifying R is just less than or equal to, I'm just using the letter R as a placeholder so that you know, we can just say, okay, we are co we're trying to confirm that X is blah, why? Okay, so that blah is the relation. So that translates to the code. <clears throat> this C statement. Now, obviously, this is not you know syntactically correct because R is a placeholder, and so is this R here. So if this is less than, then this R should also be related to less than. There are only two flags that are related to less than, and I just mentioned those two. Can someone kind of just, very good, okay, I like that, okay? So if the original statement is if X is less than Y, then you choose either C or L as the R in the JRI instruction. What if the original one is X equals equals Y? Then it's Z, very good, okay, so you guys are getting this down already, excellent. So this little template here makes it very easy for you to process this. The, the, the trick is to get the values that you want to compare into two registers. Because CMP as an instruction can only compare between two registers. You cannot compare a, a, a register against a constant. There's no CMPI, okay? You cannot compare a register to something that is in RAM, okay? There's simply no pathway in the processor to do that, okay? There's, it's just not possible, okay? All right, so we are pretty much done with in terms of all the mechanism in translation. Yes? Yes. Aha, okay, so that's a very good question. How do we choose between C versus L when we want to confirm less than? Yes. Yes. L is for signed and C is for unsigned. So let me make a little mental note that I have answered that question, that you have answered that question once already in this class, which means I'm not going to answer that question again in this semester. <laughs> I will also make a mental note to, that today is April 11th because I can then direct people to watch the video on April 11th. As annoying as it might sound to some people, how are you going to, what are you going to do so that you, know, you won't get caught with that question again? Write it down in your notes. Very good. Note taking is a very important part of taking classes at a college level. Now, obviously, if I were to take a class like this, you know, taught by another professor, I probably won't be taking a lot of notes, but I will still be taking notes, okay? Because there are very specific things that the other professor may be teaching that I'm not aware of, that I can easily understand, but I cannot remember after the lecture. I still need to write down things 
that I need to remember. Okay, so that's why you know having that habit of writing notes in a class, going like, oh, this is new to me. I'm gonna jot it down. Even if the lecture is being recorded, you still want to do that. Okay, all right. So what I'll do next is, man, I can talk about this, but this is all kind of like making things look nice and so on and so forth. I can talk about this all day long. It's kind of dry. People will just kind of fall asleep. So instead of doing this, I'm gonna write a sample program. So I'm gonna give myself a programming assignment right now. And I'll give myself some code to begin with. Okay, so I'm gonna say uh, we're dealing with unsigned um, values in this case. A, B, C, D are my registers, but I'm gonna pretend that these are variables for the sake of this discussion here. And what I wanna do is to find the minimum of the registers A, B, C, D, A, B, C, okay, except not D, and then I want D to be the minimum of A, B, and C. Does everybody understand what I want to do? I'll just kind of write a line of comment here to indicate what I want to do. I want D to be the minimum of A, B, and C. That's all I want to do. First of all, in C and C++, or C++, how are you going to do this without using min? Is that a hand? Okay, if there are, by the way, at least two ways to do this, there are many, many ways to do it. So go ahead. Oh, okay, I like that. Okay, I like where this is heading, but I can already tell you, well, I'm gonna wait until you give me the entire solution and then I'll critique it. So D should become A, right? Okay, and, and and okay. What else? Wait, wait, wait. D is not one of the things I want to compare, huh? Or B is. Uh huh. D equals what again? B. B. Okay. And okay. All right. So we're going to analyze this code first. Okay. This is getting back to CISP 360 material. We look at this code and we ask is it going to find the minimum between A, B, and C? And uh, so that we can have D being assigned the minimum. Of A, B, or C. Yes. That is well. Okay. If A is already less than B, and A is also less than, C, and B is less than C, doesn't that confirm that A is the minimum of the three of the two of the three? Aha. Very good, okay. So we caught one logical error here, which is you know, this B here should be in an A. Because, um, okay, so let, let me keep the original version like this. Because this code would not work correctly when A is, say, one, B is three, and C is two. As it is, it's not gonna work. Okay, so we'll, we'll fix it and go like, okay, this will work now. So the question is, is this code going to work? The answer is nope. Uh, well, let me see. Yeah, I think it will work in that case. So let me see what will happen in that case. Okay, this is not gonna work. Exactly. Well, where should I use less than or equal to instead of just less than? So let's not fix the program, okay? Let's think about which test case this code will fail at. In other words, 
I'm already telling you that I can construct at least one test case where this program will not work correctly. So what is that test case? Yes, go ahead. If B and C are equal and they are both smaller, the minimum, okay? So, so let's think about that scenario. So I'm just gonna make it very concrete. A is three, B is one, and so is C. C is one, two. So that will be a, a test case that's consistent with what you're talking about, right? Okay, so what is gonna happen in this case? A is less than B is false. We go to the else if. B is less than C is false. We go to the else, and it will pick up C to be the minimum. So it will still do the right thing in this case. Okay, so think again. There's at least one test case where this is going to fail. Yep. Well, if all three are the same number, it's guaranteed to work correctly because you know then D can get any one of the three and it will still be correct. So it, it will definitely work if all three are the same. So it is still one of the cases where two are the same, the other one is different, but how do you order those things? That becomes the question. A and C are? They're the least. Okay, so let's, let's try that one, okay? Because there are only so many things we can try, right? <clears throat> so let's try that one and see what's gonna happen. A is less than B, True, A is less than C, not true, not going to go here, go here. B is less than C, not true, we pick up C, C would be put into D, it is still correct. So you're so close, you're so close. A and B being the same, and they're both the minimum, yep. There we go, okay. So let's run through this code again. A is less than B, uh, -uh. Short circuit out of this one, get to here. B is less than C, is true, ah, it will still pick it up. I think there's only one that we have not talked about. Is this the one that we haven't really, this one does still work, right? I know this one is gonna work. All right. So let's find out you know, what, whether we can, we can look at the math part of this thing here and see whether that will help confirm you know, which one is not gonna work. By the time we get to this else, what do we confirm? What can we confirm? A is greater than or equal to B, or A is greater than or equal to C. That's what we can guarantee by the time we get here. So, if we know that A is greater than or equal to B, and or A is greater than or equal to C, then we know A is not the minimum. So the minimum has to be between B and C. So if B is less than C, so I think this code is actually correct. I self, so I, I, I retract my earlier statement that this is incorrect. <laughs> if this is a B, then we know for sure it's not gonna work. But I think as it is, it's gonna work. All right. So now we want to convert it into assembly code. What are you going to do? What do you do to convert this into assembly code? The first thing is to look closely to the else if, because in C and C++, there's no such language construct called else if. In some other programming languages, there's a thing called else if, which is spelled E-L-S-I-F, E-L-I-F, else if. E-L-S-I-F, I think, ELSIF. It's one word, by the way, okay? So in C and C++, there's no such thing, which means we actually have a nesting level here that is hidden because the else, after the else, the compiler is, look, is asking, give me a statement for this else. Well, turns out that statement is the entire if. So that means this code, structurally speaking, is really this code here. There's a, there's a nested if that we normally do not see. But in terms of the structure of the code, that is the case. There's a nested if here. Okay, so you look at this code and go like, okay, so that's gonna be a mess to translate. 
So we'll go ahead and apply the technique that we, ju we just talked about. So there will be many revisions to this code. So we are going to, I will send you this program when we are done with it. All right, so the first revision is to get rid of, you know, we can get rid of one conditional statement at a time. So I'm just going to work myself from the outside in. So we're going to get rid of this, you know, conditional statement or the structure of this thing first. So we're going to say if and then negate the original condition so that we can go to the else, okay? So the else is, um, I'll call this, you know, else, yeah, just else, label, else zero, okay? I cannot use else because, you know, it's already a keyword. So else is here, convert the else keyword into a label definition. And there's no curly brace needed over there. And we also need a go to um, end if at this point, and an end if is over here as a label definition. Okay. In other words, I have just applied section 3.1. I'm going to pause and see if there are any questions. Do you guys remember what was section 3.1? What did they talk about? Okay, very good. I see some nods, okay? So all I did was to negate the condition and say, hey, if this is false, we want to go to the else branch. The else branch is now identified by an identifier as a label, and this is the else branch. After the else branch, eh, that's the end of the entire you know, thing, so I put a label here. But after the then branch, the original then branch, I also need to go over here. I also should get rid of the curly braces that are here because I have just flattened the original statement. The outer conditional statement is now flattened, which means you know, all the curly braces associated with the outer conditional statement should be gone by now. Are we okay with this? All right. <clears throat> So now we look at this and go like, but are we done? No, not even close. So now we, okay, let me get rid of the test case. So now we go here and go like, ah, we still have a structured conditional statement here. This is still structured. Let me point out which part is structured. This part is still structured because we still see curly braces, okay? So we go like, okay, we'll apply section 3.1 again to make this flat, okay? which means you know, we're going to negate the condition that we're looking for, and then we now want to go to the else label. But this else label is going to be a little funky. I'll call it else zero underscore else zero. I call it else zero else zero because it is the else of an else. So that means you know, the label name that I choose to use reflect what that label is trying to represent. This is representing the else branch or the beginning of the else branch of the outer of the else branch of the outer conditional statement. It is the else inside an else. Now you can if anyone is asking, do I have to use your funky label names like this? The answer is no, you don't have to. But you will run into issues if you don't. Because if, you're, if the naming of your labels are not um, structured, that means you, know, you can run into a, um, a good chance of using the wrong label. So this is else and if, because it is the end of the if inside the else. Now, whether you need to use else zero or not, you know, eh, that's debatable. But just to be consistent, I'm going to do that. Yes? You mean this end if here? Uh, no, no, no. The one above. This one? Yeah. Oh, it should be a colon, yeah. not a semicolon, because it's a definition. It's the definition of a label, so it should be a colon. Thank you. Very good. All right. So now I have completely flattened the control structure. So as far as if, while, do, while are concerned, everything are now converted into conditional go to label definitions and unconditional go-tos. 
So what I need to do next is to look at, ah, we have a, we have a conjunction here. We have a negation here. We have another negation here. So we want to get rid of the um, logical operators. So this is the next phase of this particular, particular process. So we take this, okay, copy and paste. And now we try to get rid of the uh, negations. So with this one, I can change the way this is spelled out so that I don't have to go through the process. So what I'll do is I'm going to apply the Morgan's Law. Do you guys still remember the Morgan's Law? We kind of we talked about the Morgan's Law in this class. It's not 100% necessary for you guys to know what it is, but I think it's going to be helpful. So can someone tell me? Yeah, go ahead. Yep, so the negation of A and B is the same thing as not A or not B, okay? So I don't have to use the ugly method to get rid of the negation. I can instead you know, change, I can use algebra, you know, Boolean algebra in this case. So I can now say uh, the negation of this or the negation of that, okay? And over here, this one, I can get rid of the negation by saying, you know, C, B is greater than or equal to C instead, right? So I'm, I'm trying to use your know, Boolean algebra trick and also algebra trick as much as possible so I don't have to complicate the control structure to get rid of the operators. All right, okay, so that looks good. And then we look at this, okay, continue, copy and paste. Okay, now what do we do? Uh, let's see, this is a negation of something, but we can always just change this to become greater than or equal to, and then we can also change this to greater than or equal to. Are we still doing okay? Yep. Probably. <laughs> Looks like there is. You are correct, this one is extra. All right, yeah, but in terms of concepts, you know, we are just you know, getting rid of stuff like this. So at this point, you know, this one is like, oh, hmm. we still have this logical operator here. So we have to convert this line of code so that you know, we, comp we, we make it more complicated, but at the same time, we get rid of the um, logical or operator. Okay, so another, oops, version down here. All right, so this is when we apply section 4.2. Yes, I actually remember the section number. Section 4.2 talks about how we are going to get rid of logical or by converting the original expression into two separate if go tos. Okay, so that's what we're going to do here. And the easiest way to get that done is to copy and paste, get rid of one of the conditions here, and then get rid of the other condition over here. Okay, now we're done with you know, the application of section 4.2. Are we still doing okay so far? All right. <clears throat> All right, so now what do we do? We look at this and go like, uh, we only want less than and equal to. We don't want you know, greater than. Great, okay, that's, a, that's not too difficult to deal with. Um, if you want to confirm A is greater than or equal to C, you can just say C is less than or equal to A. If you want to confirm A is greater than or equal to B, you can say B is less than or equal to A. And then over here, kind of the same deal. You can just say, you know, uh, we just want to confirm that C is less than or equal to B in this case. Is that making sense so far? Okay. So at this point, I have done as much as I can using the techniques all the way to section four. Okay. So now the question is, um, this doesn't look like C code anymore. Is it? Is this still C code? If the original C code was compilable, would this still be compilable? The answer is yes, it is still compilable, which means 
if you're in the process of, of converting a C program into assembly language, everything up to this point can still be debugged using online GDB, code blocks, VS Code, and so on and so forth. You can still use exactly the same test cases to run through the code, and it should still have exactly the same outcome. In other words, if you, did, if you put a mistake into one of these steps, you can catch it without any understanding of assembly language programming at all. Because at this point, we're still dealing with just regular C code. It doesn't look like regular C code. If you turn in anything like this in CISP 400 or 430, your professor will frown profusely and then say, I don't think you should be using go to. But from the perspective of is it doing the same thing as the original code? Yeah, it should be. It should still be doing exactly the same thing as the original code. Yes? Why is it, why is go to frowned upon or considered a taboo? <laughs> because it, huh? Not pseudo code. It has to do with spaghetti code. So you can look into go to leading to, I cannot spell spaghetti, but Google will help me. Hmm? Say again? Yeah, yeah, I know it will. <laughs> so there's a whole Wikipedia page on spaghetti code. Um, this is one of those, those things where at a small scale, okay, if you're writing a subroutine that's only like 10 lines long and you want to use go-tos, not too big of a deal, okay? I have seen a single function that has 500 plus lines that has all kinds of go-tos. There are quote unquote, okay, I have to put air quotes because I really don't think it is legitimate, but some people think it is. So there are cases where you have go-tos where it goes kind of go all the way from like totally nested loops, conditional statements, more loops and more conditional statements, and it just go to the outermost portion because something really, really bad happened. This is nothing can be recovered. We just have to abort the entire thing, okay? So some people think it's okay. I don't think it's okay. I think you can, you can still write proper code so that you don't have to go through using go to and a label. Um, I would even consider the use of break and continue to be kind of bad. So, you know, uh, basically anything that can alter the path of execution and not only rely on the condition of the loop that you're dealing with can be considered bad because you can no longer structurally, structurally analyze your program and determine. So if I'm here in this program, I am guaranteed that this condition has to be true or this condition has to be false because there are alternative paths to get there. So that complicates you know, the analysis of the code, which also makes it harder to um, debug the program because there are multiple ways to end up at the same place. So by the time you get to that place, you can no longer mathematically say, okay, if I get to this place, this condition has to be true. That is no longer applicable. Um, so look, look up your know, spaghetti code. You know, that's a, there are a lot of discussion of you know, why it is bad. You know, generally speaking, you know, industry do not want people to use uh, go to at all. Yes? Namespaces? Well, since I mostly program in JavaScript, you know, that is a non concern. <laughs> Uh, namespaces is a good thing because it allows you to have classes, functions, and whatnot having exactly the same name, but they are in different contexts. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, because you know, once you use the, the term use uh, using namespace blah, you know that means you know there there you open up possibilities of confusion. All right, so at this point I can convert this into actual assembly code. So the question is, um, what are we going to do about you know, converting this into assembly code? So once again, we'll do it step by step. Okay, so let me see, is that a result of copy and paste? Yep. 
No, no it is not. So we have, we're going to copy and paste this one time, okay? So we'll do one thing at a time, okay? We'll focus on this one and say, okay, now we really want to convert this into assembly code. So I'm going to comment out the original C code so it's still visible, and I'm going to ask you, uh, how, how do we do this? Which section talks about the, the code to do this? The, remember you know, the R thing? You know, A, R, B converts to CMP, A, B, and then J, R, I to whatever label, right? So that's a template. Okay, since some of you are looking at me and go like, what are you talking about? This one, section 5.1. Okay, so if you go to section 5.1, it, it gives you a template. So in this case, I'm applying the template. So I'm going to say CMP, CA, and then we do a J. Um, this is unsigned, so it's JCI to deal with the less than else zero. But we also have a JZI because you know, we are going to else zero if it is less than or if it equals to. So that's why we can do both. Yep. because I said so. <laughs> I don't expect you guys to remember that, but, you know, but that's why. So the sign list is interesting because in C and C++, the sign is associated with the variables, right? But in assembly language programming, that the sign is associated only when you compare. If you're not comparing, I don't need to know what is, whether it's signed or not. But what about adding and subtracting? Well, let me ask you. Did we come up with a different adder or a different subtractor, whether we are adding or subtracting signed versus unsigned? Nope. It's the same subtractor. It's the same adder. So adding and subtracting by itself does not need to know whether we are adding signed or unsigned or subtracting signed versus unsigned. It's only when you compare that you need to know whether you're dealing with signed versus unsigned values. Okay, so, oh, okay, that doesn't look too bad. So that means this one is gonna be pretty easy too because it has a very similar structure. We do a compare BA, JCI to L0 also, and then JZI to L0, okay. What about this one? Uh, we want D to get a value of A. And we know that all of these are in registers, so we're dealing with register D versus reg register A. Do we have an instruction that can copy the content of register A to register D? CPR, CPR very good. Okay, we joked around that deal, single instruction as well when we talked about it. So CPR D A. So when I came up with the instructions for TTP, I specifically preserve the um, left-hand side versus right-hand side of operations. If something is changing, it's always the left-hand side that is changing. So this makes it a little bit easier for you to remember. Oh, so which one is which one? Same order as in C statements. So that's that. What about go to? Go to and if, okay? You know, how do we do this in TTP ASM? Okay, J is good, okay, jump. JMPI, very good, okay. Ah, that doesn't sound too hard, right? Uh, L0 as a label definition stays exactly the same as in the C code. So now we just have to deal with this you know, thing here. But we dealt with that already, okay? It's just a different compare with a different label. So we have CMP, CB. Now, I don't even remember why we are comparing C to B and not the other way around. I'm just doing a very mechanical process of this fits into that template, we apply that template, and we end up with this code. It is extremely mechanical at this point. Um, then we want to, it's a less than or equal to, so now we have the same thing, JCI, L's zero, L's zero. J, Z, I, L's zero, L's zero. Okay, now we have, uh, we want B to be in D. <clears throat> so we have a J, oh, no, we have a CPR, D, B. 
And then we have a go to. So the go to changes into a JMPI. So there we go, JMPI else zero underscore and if. Label definition stays the same. This is another CPR. CPR DC. Label definition stays the same, stays the same. We'll just put a halt instruction here. And that ends the entire program. Huh? Uh, where? Yeah, yeah. Equals to is just, uh, you're confusing equal, equal to equal. <laughs> I hate that part about the C programming language, but I love it too, because I can embed a, a, an assignment operation as a part of a condition. There are, very, there are occasions I want to do that, but it does make the code a little bit tricky to read. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, technically, we don't need both, but we have references to both of them. And they represent different points. Because else, zero, and if is really representing the end of the nested if statement of the else branch of the outermost conditional statement. And then end if is corresponding to the end of the overall outer conditional statement. So you want to keep both of them, if possible, because if we, if we want to change the logic so there are additional things to do after the nested conditional statement in the else branch, then we are inserting code between these two label definitions. Yeah. Yep. So as it is right now, you can combine both labels to one and change you know, the JMPI to use only one of the two labels. So it would end up to be the same. But I would preserve the program as it is, because you know, if I want to change the C code, if I want to, for whatever reason, right, if I want to change the original C code and insert or append anything after the nested conditional statement before the entire else branch ends, then I know where to add it. Yes. Oh, it's going to be far more complex than that. So you're going to be dealing with uh, recursive function calls, local variables, arrays, structures, pointer to structures, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, we, we are taking the first baby step into converting C code into assembly code today. But this is the only class deal you know, that we actually need to talk about control structure, as in conditional statements and loops. So all of the other classes will be talking about how do you call a function? How do you return a value from a function? How do you pass parameters? How do you pass arguments? How do you pick up the parameters from inside the function? Um, how do you access something that is indirect, okay, using a dereference operator? Um, how do you pass the address of a member of a structure that is pointed to by a pointer? That sort of stuff. And we got, what, about four weeks to do it? A little less than four weeks? It, it's doable, okay? So the, the point, the, the important part is make sure that you clear all the material after each class before the next class. Okay, that is super important because otherwise things will be stacking up too fast. It's kind of like playing Tetris. Okay, you guys are too young to, to know what that is. Never mind. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm turning you guys into C compilers right now. <laughs> All right. So we, we still have one minute to go. I, I want to make a point. I don't have enough time to do it today. So if you are to, okay, assuming I don't make any stupid mistakes, okay, if you are to copy the code from here all the way to the end and you know, uh, put it into the processor, initialize you know, registers A, B, and C to some value that you want to use as a test case, it should work. Okay? 
So that is the whole point, is I just converted a program or C code with nested contro control structure into assembly code. That is the whole process, okay? Um, let me give you the code of today's lab. So we do have a lab today for compiling stuff. And let's see. All right, so today's lab is this one, compiling C control structures. I need to change the date, obviously, because I, I just came back from a meeting, so I didn't have time to do it. Um, GCC is the access code, and then I need to change all of these dates. I'll see you guys over at the lab.